not all patients coming on the cancer pathway come from GPs. Some will come through the national screening uh, programs. And we have Erin um, here to talk to us about the um, screening program and her role as a, as a screening nurse specialist. So Erin, um, when you're ready. Hello, uh, my name is Erin Oaks and I am one of the specialist screening practitioners for the, or better known as SSPs, um, for the NHS Bowel Cancer Screening Program. The purpose of the program is to offer screening to detect bowel cancer at an early stage when treatment is most likely to be effective for those thought to be at an increased risk. This is achieved by removing polyps, uh, which are growths on the bowel wall that if left in place can turn into cancer over extended time, such as 10 to 15 years. Polyps are very common. They affect 15 to 20 percent of the UK population at some point in your life. An individual with polyps or an early bowel cancer won't display symptoms, shown here, um, that would prompt a visit to the GP. Screening is offered to people registered at their GP between the ages of 56 to 74 with the aim of lowering the screening age to include 50-year-olds and above by the end of 2025. Eligible individuals are sent an easy-to-use poo kit called a fecal immunochemical test kit also known as a FIT, in the post every two years. This is an example, example there. The poo sample is returned by post and analyzed to determine if further investigations are recommended. Our Norwich Screening Center catchment area includes people in Great Yarmouth, Norwich, and Kings Lynn. So approximately 1.1 million people in this area are eligible for screening. This, this is a picture of our findings at our screening center from 2023. And I did just want to point out that we had 92 cancers that we found through the screening program, but also 273 people that we potentially saved from developing a bowel cancer, as well as other people as well. Um, our department is based at the Quadrum Institute, so across the way, and the team includes clinical staff as well as administrative staff. Those individuals with a positive test, meaning small traces of blood were found in their stool, are offered a telephone appointment with one of the SSPs to discuss the test result and the option of further investigations, and this is where my role as an SSP starts. As an SSP, I carry out pre-assessments on the telephone to determine suitability for a colonoscopy. A colonoscopy is a camera test which uses a thin flexible scope with a picture on the end inserted into the bottom to look at the lining of the large bowel to look for polyps. The bowel needs to be completely empty, so the person needs to drink a very strong laxative to ensure their bowel is, is empty. Part of the assessment is ensuring the person is safe to have a colonoscopy and liaising with other medical professionals as required. This includes medication management, assessing ability to consent to have a colonoscopy, and recognizing contraindications such as a recent stroke or a recent cardiac stent insertion. I also consider the person's mobility in relation to managing the bowel preparation. I document all of this on our system called Open Exeter and schedule the colonoscopy appointment. Another part of my job is being present in the room when a bowel screening patient is having a colonoscopy. I document anything found during the procedure, including polyps, cancers, piles, inflammation, etc. Any polyp seen will be removed with a snare, which the individual won't feel, which the individual won't feel because there are no nerve endings or pain receptors in the bowel. However, we do offer pain relief and sedation, which is a conscious sedation, so you're not going to go to sleep, um, and then also entinox if needed. Uh, it can make you feel a bit crampy and bloated. The samples known as histology are sent to the lab and examined under the microscope, and the results for the bowel screening patients come back in about seven to 10 days. I process the results on our system and phone the patient with the results and advise if they will need a polyp site check based on criteria, a three-year surveillance colonoscopy, or if they'll be returned to screening, which means they'll receive another poo kit in two years' time. The bowel screening program recently took over the surveillance colonoscopies for individuals with Lynch syndrome, which is a genetically inherited condition that increases the individual's risk of developing bowel cancer and some other cancers. 
The last major part of my role as an SSP is to attend a variety of meetings, which includes the colorectal MDT, which Carrie has already discussed, and best interest meetings. Best interest meetings are for individuals that need a further assessment by a gastroenterology consultant to determine suitability or, mass, or, or mental capacity to consent to proceed with a colonoscopy. This usually happens when the fit kit is completed on an individual's behalf without consent and without understanding what a positive fit means. There are occasions when a screening colonoscopy is not in an individual's best interest, um, such as an a person with advanced dementia. The individual may not be able to follow instructions to stay safe during the procedure and would likely find the whole thing very distressing. We would make these individuals and their carers symptom aware and advise they see their GP should any symptoms develop. I thoroughly enjoy my role as an SSP. Each day is different and I love educating people about our program and signs and symptoms to, to be aware of with the hopes of contributing to the prevention of bowel cancer. When I initially speak to patients on the telephone, they are understandably very anxious, frightened, or embarrassed about the idea of having a colonoscopy or the hesitation about the bowel preparation. I find being there for people during an extremely vulnerable time in their lives so rewarding, and I am proud to be an SSP for the NHS Bowel Cancer Screening Program, and I'm proud of the work that we do as a team to provide our patients with the best possible care. Thank you. Um, and if anybody wants to know any more about um, the NHS or National um, Screening Service, then you can find that on www.nhs.uk. Um, I'm now going to invite three members of the um, histopathology team, James, Ellen, and Deborah, to come and talk about um, histopathology and their and their role in the uh, cancer pathway. And as a as a used to be wannabe his, uh, hemato histopathologist, I'm very interested. Thank you. My name is James Day. I'm an associate practitioner in histopathology. Um, my colleagues, Debbie and Ellen, are a biomedical scientist and specialist biomedical scientist in histopathology. Uh, so we work in the histopathology laboratory, uh, which tends to be, I think, a bit of a mysterious area for a lot of people. You sort of send your sample to the lab, you wait X amount of time, you receive a sample back from the lab uh, without a lot, necessarily a lot of knowledge of what goes on in the, in the interim there. So hopefully between the three of us, we can shed a little bit of light on uh, the process which occurs and how we uh, get those reports to clinicians and ultimately uh, the patients behind the specimens. Uh, so histopathology is the diagnosis and study of human disease and tissue. Um, we receive around 61,000 patient samples every year. Um, we receive them in these little pots. We've got a little example of our pots that we receive them in. Uh, sometimes we'll get multiple pots per patient, sometimes we'll be much larger pots. Um, but it's around 91,000 specimen pots every year, so really huge numbers of uh, samples that we're dealing with. Um, they get a macroscopic description and they can, each pot can generate between one and 150 samples each. Um, so every day we're generating sort of 700 tissue samples. Um, we receive these specimen pots from uh, locations all over the county. So we get them from surgery at the NNN. And um, we get them from James Padgett, um, GPs across the county as well. Um, after the sample has been checked at reception, we sort it into a state of clinical urgency. And depending on its processing time. So larger specimens will take longer to process, smaller specimens can be turned around much quicker. Um, larger specimens in most cases will require a specialist pathologist to uh, undertake some dissection on the tissue before the next stages. All tissue we receive are preserved by formalin, which presents it from, uh, prevents it from decaying, makes the tissue firmer, and makes it safe for the staff to work with. It, it reduces the risk of infectious disease. Um, but formalin, uh, sorry, formalin penetrates tissue really, really slowly, so we're talking about a millimetre an hour. So you can imagine much, much larger specimens, we're gonna have to, there's a much longer period of where we're gonna have to wait for that formalin to fully um, fix the tissue. Um, types of specimens can vary as well, so we get all sorts from all over the body. Um, they can be very, very tiny, small uh, needle biopsies uh, to full limbs, full organ systems. Um, that are also specimens that are gonna require decalcification, so you sort of more bony tissue. Uh, again, that's gonna, um, take a little bit longer. We also receive fresh specimens, so specimens that aren't fixed in formalin. Um, so really, really urgent specimens we might receive fresh, um, and they require immediate processing. So, for example, if somebody had an unexpected finding in surgery, we might receive that fresh specimen and get the result back to the surgeons sort of in the same day while the uh, patient is still undergoing surgery. 
Um, once we produce tissue samples from these specimen pots, uh, we load them onto tissue processing machines overnight usually. Uh, so that aids, that aids in further tissue fixation by pressure and heat treatment of formaldehydes. Um, and then the tissue is dehydrated, all the water is sort of sucked out of the tissue before it's impregnated with molten paraffin wax. Uh, so that helps further preserve the tissue, strengthens the specimen, and it's really important for the next stages of the process, which uh, Ellen is going to take you through. Hello. Um, so when the processed tissue is removed the following morning, um, the urgent and the two-week wait specimens are prioritised in order to expedite their specimen journey. As sometimes these samples require greater caretaking in the following stages and may require further testing to reach a diagnosis. Um, the tissue is orientated and embedded in a paraffin wax by hand, creating a specimen block. So I have some examples. This is what our tissue is embedded in, in the wax. Um, this preserves and protects the tissue, and last year we produced 174,744 blocks of tissue. These blocks are then cut onto a microtome, which produces a thin ribbon of tissue and wax when pressed against the static blade, um, and it produces a slide. So each one of these is produced by hand. Different types of specimens require varying depths of the tissue to be cut into um, to give the best overview of the structures present. So for example, a gastrointestinal biopsy requires three deeper levels throughout the tissue. Therefore, great care is taken at this stage by the person performing this procedure as all the slides are produced by hand. Sections of this ribbon and are placed onto the slide and processed on an auto stainer to rehydrate and stain the tissue with our characteristic purple and pink hematoxylin and eosin, which demonstrates the different structures of the tissue. So you can see two examples of hematoxylin and eosin staining on the screen. All the slides undergo this h &E staining primarily before being quality checked and released from the laboratory um, to specialist pools or to a pathologist. So at the end of December 2023, we had produced 294,936 individual h &E slides. From the h &E slides alone, pathologists can make a diagnosis over 70% of the time without the need for further work. So I'll pass over to Debbie to talk a little bit about our further work. Hello, I'm a specialist biomedical scientist and I specialise in immunohistochemistry. Um, to aid further diagnosis, a pathologist will request extra work, as Ellen said, to be performed. Much of this extra work is immunohistochemistry, which is my speciality, which uses antibodies to identify key areas of the tissue to provide specific answers to diagnostic queries. Immunohistochemical staining are specific either positive or negative results. However, some tests require result in varying degrees of antigen expression, which directly impacts the staining um, and the treatment of the patient that they will see following their diagnosis. So um, we have about 160 antibodies that we stain for routinely. However, in our department, we do a lot of specialised staining as well. So we do HER2 staining and fluorescence in situ hybridisation, also known as FISH. And this is for determining Herceptin treatment for breast cancer in patients. So I will score and report on these cases, which is quite a specialised thing. Also, another thing in my role, um, since 2017, our department also undertakes molecular testing on the paraffin tissue, which use the same blocks, to further aid specific treatment op options for patients by seeing which patients are eligible for gene-targeted therapies to work alongside chemotherapy, radiotherapy, um, and this aids in a much better prognosis for, treat for patients. We also pair tests for molecular that we don't do in our department, which get sent to the East Genomics Centre at Cambridge, but there's lots of other um, specialist centres throughout the country we send work to. Um, in our lab, we do molecular tests for gastric, lung and skin melanoma cases, so I do that as part of my routine work. And we also have another specialised test called PDL1 for lung cancers. Um, when the diagnosis is achieved by either the pathologist, training pathologist or reporting biomedical scientists, the collated results are presented at MDTs, as discussed previously, um, which then further aid treatment plans which are made for the patients. Um, 
So despite the fact that we don't directly work with patients as such, um, within our roles we're acutely aware of the responsibility in patient care and work to our best ability and many people in the department have friends or family that have had cancer, some of whom have survived and others are not so fortunate. In my role, most of the tests from patients with known cancer, and in some cases patients have three or four grade cancers with tumours, so um, efficiency is a high priority, especially in my role. Um, just a quick overview of the pictures. So the top left is um, a picture of skin, and the red staining is HMB45 positive, so that's a skin melanoma case. The bottom green and black one, it's just a pretty picture. It's a special stain. It's not immuno, just added because it's pretty. It's just showing, <laughs> just showing some fungi. Um, the bottom right is what I was saying about the HER2 staining for breasts. So that's, a, we'd score that a 2 plus. If that's a 2 plus equivocal, and then that's would go to fish staining, which we also mentioned, and then the top one is a three plus, which we grade, and that's positive, so the person would get a septum treatment. And that's it, thank you very much. So thank you, team, for um, taking us through histopathology, which I think we quite underappreciate, really, as clinicians, quite how complicated it is, especially when you're... Um, um, out in the twilight zone of the Cotman Centre. So thank you for coming to share that with us. I mean, the new uh, techniques and technologies with the molecular analysis and the genomics will change will change things a lot. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. So next we've got um, Sam Fletcher-Brown, who's newly in post as the Ops Manager for Hematology and Oncology, is going to tell us about his role in terms of responsibility for the provision of specialist services here at the North Norwich, but specifically Hematology and Oncology. So thank you, Sam. Thank you. So, uh, as I said, my name's Sam, and as of the beginning of the year, I'm the Operations Manager for Haematology and Oncology, although I've been in the Trust for um, a number of years. And my role is really to oversee the overall management of oncology and haematology and to ensure that our targets, both national, so set by the government and the NHS, and local, so set by um, the region or the Trust or the department, are met and that we're uh, working in a way that's um, financially viable and also that we've got policies um, and systems in place for the well-being of our staff, of patients and their relatives and that we're um, performing in a cultural way that's um, in line with our organisation's um, values and that everybody has a voice and can work with integrity. Um, I work with clinical and non-clinical colleagues to ensure efficient, effective and safe care and experience for our patients. I use data and patient stories and staff stories to plan for our services and I look at each part of our patient pathway, identifying pinch points and look at what we can do, learning from those stories and learning from what other um, NHS trusts do um, to learn and improve any of these for a better overall experience. A day in my role is varied and no day looks the same. Uh, indeed, the um, bed pressures at the moment um, have been such that when I was on the ward the other day, we were short in people to hand out meals to patients on the ward, so I donned a penny and handed out some meals. But um, there are some tasks which I complete regularly, and these include solving issues from wards to assist with discharges, prioritising scans or reviews, managing departmental budgets, taking and setting actions for um, risks, ensuring these are documented and discussed, uh, monitoring our performance and working with our key stakeholders to improve performance and experience, creating strategic business plans to support these improvements for the benefit of our staff, patients and our local population. But as well as having an overview of the services and processes, I also look at patient level detail um, for patients on our cancer and non-cancer waiting lists. And I work with our patient pathway coordinators, our MDT coordinators, our secretaries, specialist nurses, our cancer team, everybody involved, um, really, to ensure, going patient by patient, that the next steps are in place, that we have a plan. I take escalations, any concerns, and I raise concerns to ensure that referrals, diagnostic tests, diagnoses, discussions, treatments, etc., 
um, are all in place and to ensure that patients receive the correct care in a timely manner. Uh, and I'm really privileged to work with such a, a wide variety of stakeholders, which include patients our, and their relatives, our administrators, our nurses, nurse specialists, our doctors, our other clinical professionals, consultants, radiographers, the cancer team, basically everybody who works or comes to our organisation um, and has a part in their patient's journey. I believe that everybody plays their part and actually by enabling them to do their jobs well um, and to work effectively and with integrity is essential for us to be able to deliver that high quality patient care and experience. What motivates me most to do my job is to get to know my staff and patients and to be able to take a view and work collaboratively to improve, modernise and use a variety of perspectives and discussions to learn and be able to ensure that our services are effective, efficient and accessible for all to ensure that high quality care for our patients and local population. Hello. I'm Paul and I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in December 2019. My diagnosis of prostate cancer and treatment plan was given to me by my uro-oncology specialist nurse in a face-to-face -face consultation. I was told I would meet my consultant in a few weeks' time. The treatment plan was to be three years androgen deprivation therapy plus external beam radiotherapy with a high dose rate brachytherapy boost. I was surprised there was no mention of surgery and questioned this. Perhaps I'm old school and thought if something's gone wrong, you get rid of it, just cut it out. But anyway, she explained to me the reasoning why surgery was not indicated in my case. Not being disrespectful, but I was somewhat surprised that the diagnosis and treatment plan was delivered to me by a nurse and not a doctor. However, she had the initial supply of tablets for the first few weeks and had contacted my GP surgery to let them know my diagnosis. She also told my surgery I would be needing the first androgen deprivation implant in a week's time, followed by an implant every 12 weeks. So after that appointment, I went to my GP surgery to make an appointment for the first implant and they were expecting me. Everything appeared to be running like a well-oiled machine, and it was very comforting to know how quickly and smoothly the system ran. I was given and read some excellent patient information sheets of the radiotherapy techniques and procedures used here. These had been written by the department here, and together with information I had read from Prostate Cancer UK, I attended my first consultation with my consultant a few weeks later, armed with a bit of knowledge and lots of concerns and questions. At this first meeting with my consultant, we discussed the treatment plan in depth. We also discussed in great detail the high dose rate brachytherapy boost. This was something that I hadn't heard of before. I liked the idea of the brachytherapy, actually getting the radiation as close to the tumor site as possible without the radiation having to go through other tissue and risk damaging that tissue. I was a bit concerned about a long five hour anesthetic as I have a pacemaker. However, my consultant said she would check with her anesthetist if I would be suitable for that length of anesthetic. If anyone's interested, the pacemaker was not a contraindication. I had the high dose rate brachytherapy together with the long anesthetic. And as you can see, I'm still here. There are, of course, side effects from all sorts of treatments, and these were discussed. Tiredness being one that comes from androgen deprivation therapy and also the radiotherapy. Ways of trying to manage this were discussed. I was also concerned about one of the potential side effects of pelvic radiation, bowel issues. And we discussed the use of a device which goes by the delightful name of rectal spacer. This minimizes the amount of radiation to the rectum. It was not at that time recommended by NICE, but my consultant had managed to acquire some from the manufacturer to try, and one was reserved for me. Some of the thoughts that immediately come to mind at diagnosis are, how long have I got to live? Is it terminal? Will the treatment cure the cancer? What are the side effects of the treatments like? 
How can I deal with these side effects if I get them? And of course, why me? Of course, some of these questions cannot be answered accurately. However, the treatment I was offered was given with intent to cure. I felt a mixture of anger. Why me? I've had my PSA checked annually. But also a feeling of calm came over me, knowing I would be in a safe pair of hands with an excellent team looking after me. I came away from that first meeting with my consultant, feeling a lot more positive about my situation and the future. She was very calm and empathetic to my situation, listening to all my concerns, worries and questions which were answered. Little did I know that the plan would be delayed due to COVID-19 and its effect on hospital procedures, etc. However, that's another story. However, during this time, my consultant and the specialist nurses were available to answer queries and reassure me when I raised my concerns about the delay to my radiotherapy, none of them giving the impression that I was being a nuisance. It's important to look forward, and that's one of my favourite holiday places, so I thought I'd put that on rather than images of my prostate with brachytherapy <laughs> needles in place. Thank you for listening. <laughs>